Right, I think, um, Adrian, it's uh, bang on half past six. Um, I'm mindful of everyone's time, so I think we're going to start tonight's webinar, and I'm quite excited about this one. Uh, I've known Adrian for a couple of years. I think we first met at a conference in South Africa in 2017. We did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so Adrian is a uh, past president of the UK chapter. Um, he's also an author, written two books. The one book that I have read extensively um, is uh, the one about problem solving. Um, really great book if you can get your hands in that and um, re have a read of that. And the other one was The Business Analyst. Um, Adrian's also an internationally renowned and known speaker, um, travels the conference circuit, and when you follow him on LinkedIn, it's it's Paul. I think we've uh, lost your audio. If you're there, Paul. Ah, uh, there I'm back. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. I can hear you now. <laughs> yeah. Somehow I muted myself. Anyway, um, so. Um, just welcoming Adrian tonight um, on his brand new topic. I think it's hot off the press. First time in New Zealand. I think it's also first time you actually doing a presentation in New Zealand, Adrian. So uh, yes, and in fact, this is the first place. Uh, this is the first time ever I've given this presentation. So I guess we could call it the global premiere. <laughs> ah, yes, well done, New Zealand. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to take up any more of Adrian's time. Um, Adrian, um, it's up to you. Go for it. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you, Paul, for that, that really warm introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me to present. Um, really, really uh, excited to, to have that opportunity. So as Paul mentioned, my, my name is Adrian Reed. The presentation tonight is entitled Systems Thinking, Practical BA Techniques for Business Agility. Now, one thing I think we probably all have in common, even though uh, you, you and I are on separate continents, even though we might have different job titles and even though we might work in different industries, is that the organisations we work for are increasingly living in, existing in, working in business environments that, that change really, really rapidly. And of course, if I was giving this presentation a year ago, I'd have now been talking about uh, competitive disruption. And I'd have, I'd have been talking about emerging technology that enables new business models. And I'd have been talking about you know, other types of digital disruption. And of course, all of those things are still true. Our organizations are still dealing with those. But, you know, <laughs> we're also in the middle of a, a global pandemic. And I mean, if you think about the way that organizations have dealt with that pandemic, it's probably fair to say that some have dealt with it better than others. Some have been able to exhibit more agility in that unexpected situation. It's also probably true to say that some governments, some countries have dealt with the pandemic better than others. And, and I say that with a little bit of a shred of irony in that, um, you know, certainly from what I see in the media here in, in the UK, uh, you know, New Zealand seem to sense the issue very quickly, respond to it, and are now in a very different position to say the country I'm in, the UK. So agility is interesting because it exists at all sorts of levels. It exists at a, a arguably a national level, an organisational and a project level. So I'm going to be talking about agility in the broadest sense. I, I'm not going to be specifically talking about agile, so I'm not going to be talking about, say, Scrum or Kanban or any of those things, although they're obviously important building blocks to all of this. Um, and in fact, business agility is such a broad topic that I'm going to look at it through a lens. And the lens I'm going to look at it through is systems thinking. Systems thinking itself is a huge topic. So we're going to look at that through a very specific lens. We're going to look at it through the, the, the like applicable techniques we can use as BAs to help our organizations uh, be really, really, uh, you know, to, to have that, that level of agility. And my presentation is split into two main parts. The first half, I'm going to talk about why, why, why agility is, is, is relevant, why it's important. 
I'll use a slight, slight historical case study to set the scene in that part. Then I'm going to move in in the second half and talk about how. And I want to share with you a bunch of techniques from the world of systems thinking that, that we could perhaps use as practitioners as well. I'll be going through those techniques relatively quickly. So if you want to know more about any of them, uh, there's a sort of references slide at the end. And you will also see references on the slide where you can find out more. So I want to start by talking about why this stuff is, or why I think this stuff is important. And I want to talk about a historic case study. It's going to sound quite <laughs> random. It is relevant, I promise. So strap yourself in for this one. <laughs> I want you to imagine that it is March 1980. You may or may not have been born in March 1980, but even if you weren't, just imagine what the world was like. If you lived in the UK at the time, uh, like, like, you know, like I do, I believe the, uh, the number one hit single at the time was The Jam, Going Underground, which is a fantastic song. Uh, you might have been very excited because the next episode of Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, was coming out in just a couple of months. But certainly, depending on where you lived in the world, you might also have been quite worried about impending nuclear war. Because one thing that is really easy to forget about the 1980s is that global thermonuclear war actually looked like a plausible possibility. There were increasing tensions between you know, nations like the USA, the, the UK and, and, and other European nations and the USSR and, uh, and things were really escalating. In March 1980, uh, Russia invaded uh, Afghanistan. The tensions were at an all time high. And it turns out for decades before, the UK government had been making plans for what would happen if nuclear bombs were to have dropped on, on the nation. They'd gone as far as making a series of public information films that would be broadcast if nuclear war was seen as imminent and unavoidable. They were classified. They were never meant to be seen unless that happened. But in March 1980, they were leaked. And they were shown on a primetime news programme called Panorama. So I want you to imagine that you're, you're flicking through the three channels that existed in the UK at that time. And this came up on your TV set. Nuclear explosions are caused by weapons such as H-bombs or atom bombs. They are like ordinary explosions, only many times more powerful. They cause great heat and blast. They also make a cloud of deadly dust, which falls slowly to the ground. This is what is called fallout. So these are the two dangers. First, heat and blast, which is followed by fallout. You can protect yourself and your family. And later on, we will show you what steps to take. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but I find everything about that public information film terrifying, down to the, the sort of clinical voice that the narrator has, to the sort of terrifying music that they've chosen, and the iconography of the family with the protect and survive around it. That's actually an edited down version. That There are actually 20, 20 episodes of that, and it's chilling. It's, it, it's terrifying. And it caused panic. I mean, people were really, really scared. And it turns out the UK government, if you think about agility, had seen this threat coming of nuclear war and had started to plan for it. If you're interested in what would have happened, of course, luckily, this, this never happened. Uh, but what would have happened in the, in the case of a, a bomb dropping on the UK, 
um, the, the country would be divided into regional headquarters because communication would be very, very difficult. So the local municipalities, the local councils, the councillors would be down in a nuclear bunker trying to control whatever little resources were left and figuring out how they would be distributed. Residents like people like you and I were given uh, essentially a set of, 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 of advices on how to survive. And one of the uh, pieces of advice was, well, you know, hide under your stairs. Uh, if you haven't got stairs to hide under, this is actually from a, a government pamphlet at the time. Well, why not take a few doors off their hinges and then put some sandbags and suitcases full of clothes against those uh, those doors. And you'll need to sort of stay under there for about 14 days until the uh, the fallout uh, the fallout subsides. Now, if you're looking at that thinking, that is completely ridiculous you have some pretty good science on your side. In fact, experts at the time were telling the UK government that this response is really not fit for the threat that was being faced. So if we take, for example, one piece of advice, just one piece of advice, which was listen to your radio, right? It sounds sensible, right? Listen to your radio, have a radio with batteries because the only way the government will be able to communicate with you is by radio. Well, the World Health Organization published a report about the effects of, of the nuclear war. And one of the things that they observed was that there'd be a huge electromagnetic pulse now, electromagnetic magnetic pulses can destroy electronic devices and transistors. And one of the things that they, uh, that they actually concluded was a single thermo thermonuclear explosion uh, could in principle disrupt radio and telephone communication over practically the whole of North America or of Europe. So radio communication just wasn't going to be practical for civilians. Yet that was the, the advice that the government was giving. There were other reports that went on to say, well, OK, you know, you can hide under your stairs and if by some miracle you survive, well, actually, what are you going to eat? Because there's going to be effects on animals and on crops. So it's not really a holistic, systemic response to that threat, right? The, you know, the, the, the threat's been spotted, but the response doesn't seem coherent. The British, British Medical Association took the unprecedented uh, uh, step of actually publishing a book on the medical effects of nuclear war. This was back in 1984. And, and it makes, again, chilling reading, essentially concluding that the health service has no way of coping with the mass casualties that would occur. But one, I think, really interesting conclusion that's drawn is essentially that a lot of the advice the UK government was issuing would have made a lot of sense in a conventional war. It might have even made sense if there were single nuclear bombs dropped in very regional areas. But that wasn't the threat the country was facing in the UK. Now think about 1980, think about the UK if you, if you happen to know that history. The last threat of air attacks that the country faced. And it was really World War II. And in World War II, if you happen to know about UK civil defence in, 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 in the 40s, there was what we, what we called Dad's Army. There were people, local wardens, who would help put fires out. You were even given advice on how to make an air raid shelter in your garden with corrugated iron. And when the threat was incendiary bombs and conventional bombs being dropped by, in this case, the Luftwaffe, that made a huge amount of sense. It would save your life. It was, a, it was a good response. The trouble was the threat in the 1980s of a huge number of intercontinental ballistic missiles with nuclear payloads, it was a very different threat. It's almost like the context had changed significantly, but the response hadn't. It's like someone in government had said, well, you know what, World War II, things worked out well. Let's take that model and transplant it into this global thermonuclear war world that we're potentially facing. 
Now, I know that sounds crazy and you're thinking, well, Adrian, we don't work in the UK and we, we luckily aren't, uh, hopefully, a threat of nuclear war at the moment. And, and I know that. But I bet you've seen situations in your own organisations where somebody has taken some best practice from a completely different situation and they've transplanted it into an organisation without thinking about whether that best practice actually works. And when doing that, it probably doesn't end well. It's not having that agility to understand what's happening outside, what's happening inside, and, and actually coming up with a coherent response. So I want to talk about how we can avoid those situations. We can avoid just, you know, there is a place for best practice, of course, uh, but how we can avoid taking practice from one area, putting it into another, expecting it to work and being surprised when it doesn't. So if we think about agility broadly, we can think about it as, as having the ability to see and having the ability to act. So if you imagine outside our organisations, there's a whole flux of events and ideas happening. Like there are opportunities, there are threats, there are you know, competitors popping up, there, there's new technology, you name it, it's out there in the flux. But the thing is, organisations can't, it's impossible for organisations to look at everything. There's no way an organisation can know and know and understand everything that's happening. So an organisation has to look at that flux through a lens. It has to appreciate what's, you know, it has an appreciative setting. Where it looks depends on what it sees. If it doesn't look at its competitive landscape, it can't respond to it. If it doesn't look at the emerging tech, that might be relevant for it, it can't respond to it. So appreciation is about, is about what it sees. And as BAs, I think one of the things we help our organisations to do is appreciate what's changing, is to see it. But now just seeing it isn't enough. Then what organisations tend to do is they, they have internal standards as to what's important and what's not. So organisations have missions and visions and they have product lines. And if something's seen in the flux, then it tends to be compared against those standards to see whether anything needs to change. It's like, oh, there's a, you know, there's a new bit of technology in this area. Well, that could be relevant for us to, to implement. So then that leads to a decision and an action. And there's, of course, a time lag. So as BAs, areas we can definitely help are, one, helping our organisation see those things that are out there in the flux, we need to understand the organization's standards, its values, its mission, its vision, so that we can help them figure out what's relevant. And if we can help reduce that time lag between when, they, when an organization realizes something needs to happen and it actually happening, then that's a step towards agility. So let's bring in some systems thinking. Now, there are many, many flavors of systems thinking, many, many definitions. And when I'm talking about a system, I'm definitely not talking about just IT. Now, IT systems are important, of course, but I'm, I'm thinking about zooming out. I'm thinking about, you know, a system involving people, politics, processes, all of those sorts of things. And one of the best definitions I've ever come across is from the Open University. And the OU defines a system as an integrated whole distinguished by its particular purpose for a particular observer, the whole's essential properties arise from the relationship between its parts. So the whole's essential properties arise from the relationships between its parts. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because as analysts, as organisations, we, we spend a lot of time analysing parts like departments or teams or IT systems or processes, but we don't always talk about the connections so much. And maybe that's another area where as BAs we really help because we often, we might not use the term systems thinking, but we often talk about stepping back and seeing the whole and holistic thinking. And, and those ideas have a family resemblance with systems thinking. So why should we care about systems thinking and business analysis agility generally. Well, I just picked out a couple of quotes here. So 
James and Suzanne Robertson in their 2019 book, Business Analysis Agility, uh, observed that analysis and systems thinking is one of the prime ingredients for achieving the right outcome. In the 2017 book, um, Business Analysis and Agile, or Agile and Business Analysis, Debbie Paul and Lynn Gervin uh, observed that systems thinking helps analysts to en enable organizational agility. If you look in the IIBA Business Analysis Body of Knowledge BA Bot Guide, systems thinking is seen as a, an underlying competency of business analysis. So there are increasingly more and more authors and organizations sort of signposting to us that these are important topics for us to embrace within our practice as BAs. So that's why, that's why I believe these are interesting topics that we could you know that we could, could could play with and explore to avoid those situations where we take a practice from elsewhere and it doesn't work to look more holistically i, I want to talk now about how we can do that i want to share with you some tools some techniques for doing that and in this part of the presentation i'm going to cover four main topics i want to talk about assessing the context because not all situations are going to call for systems thinking. I then want to talk about understanding perspectives and boundaries because different stakeholders might have different views on whatever our system, process, service, whatever it is we call it, whatever we're working on, they might have very different perspectives on what that thing is for. And we're going to look at a technique called systems maps and a technique known as critical systems heuristics in that section. We'll then briefly talk about understanding the problem situation. I'll, I'll briefly show you a multiple cause diagram there. And then very, very, very briefly at the end, I want to talk about proposing and taking action. And we'll look a little bit at backcasting and the brown cow model there. So first of all, purpose. And pers oh, oh no, sorry, first of all, assessing context, <laughs> getting ahead of myself. How do we go about understanding how complex the situation we're working in is? Well, there are many sense-making frameworks out there. One that I want to talk a little bit about today is the Stacy diagram. Now, this was first proposed by Ralph Stacy, who's written a lot about complexity theory. It has to be said I'm using it slightly out of context here. I'm putting a business analysis lens on it and I'm, I'm showing you a slightly simplified and adapted version of it. And Stacy drew two dimensions. So on the y-axis, on the, the vertical axis, how far or close to agreement people are on, like why change is necessary and what changes we could think of in our world and how close to certainty or far from certainty experts are on how that problem could be solved. So extending the, the diagram a little bit, for, for business analysis, we could think about like the axis being what, why and what on the, uh, hor uh, the vertical axis and how on the uh, horizontal axis. And if you're, if, you, if you're facing a problem situation, a project where you know what, you go in there, there's consensus about the why and the what. There's already agreement on how it should be solved and that, that feels right. Then you're probably in the domain of rational decision making. If you're in the extreme bottom left hand corner, it's probably a case of just do it. People agree, you know, the, you, there's linear causation. Things can be proven. It's going to be a relatively straightforward project, you know, touch wood. That's actually probably an area where I, I know this is always an un, an unpopular thing to say, but waterfall might work there. You know, if, if the requirements are stable, it, it might well work. There's certainty. If you're in a governmental situation, that's the zone of evidence-based policy making. You know, there's, there's linear cause-effect relationships. Systems thinking might add something, but it's not going to add a huge amount in that zone. If you've got disagreement on the why and the what, People don't seem to agree on why this change is even necessary, but you've got certainty on how. That's where people have fallen in love with a solution. <laughs> and that's often about political decision-making. And 
you, you've probably all found this where someone's fallen in love with the technology, with, with the technology, but it's like, well, hang on a minute. Why do we need that? Techniques that we'll cover in the next section may well help with that political decision making. But the area where the stuff I'm talking about today will add most value is in that middle bit in the complex decision making uh, uh, arena. Now, the reason I show this diagram is this and others like it, I find really useful when I'm parachuted in, when you started to get a sense of the stakeholder landscape to say, OK, where are we? You know, are we in the rational decision? Is everything really clear? Are we down here? Great. Then we can just do it. Or are we somewhere over here? In which case we need to do more analysis. And I find personally the danger is where stakeholders assume we're down here. They assume there's consensus, but actually no, we're, we're miles away. And that's where we have to nudge. We have to get people on the same page. We have to use all of those skills that we know and love as BAs. So we've talked about assessing context. I now want to talk about understanding perspectives and boundaries. And I'm going to throw a picture up on the next slide. And I want you to just think, uh, you know, think what it is a picture of and what it's for. And you can write it down or, you know, or just think it in your head. And it isn't a trick question, I promise you. This is the picture. And the particular item I want you to think, what is it and what it's for, is it for, is this. I'm pretty sure that all of you are now saying, well, the photo is a bit blurry, Adrian, but it looks like some steps or some stairs. And you'd be 100% right. And when I asked you what it's for, you probably thought something like, well, that's an odd question, Adrian. It's for people to get up and down the hill. And you'd be right. Except what's really interesting is this person here, you might notice, is using them for a different purpose. They're actually running up and down the stairs as a form of exercise. So this picture is taken in uh, it's Castle Field, which is down on the, the south coast of the, the UK. And I've no idea where the, when those stairs were built, but I do know that they're, they're built like this, that there's a castle and battlements at the very top of that, that hill there, presumably where there used to be cannons. So they might well have been hundreds of years old. And the thing is, I'm pretty sure that when they were being built, nobody was thinking about designing them for exercise. Yet that's how they're being used. And isn't that interesting that the products and services we define, that we build, may well have uses, you know, our, our customers, our users may well find uses for them that we never expected. Now, just imagine we went up to that person who's exercising there and we said to them, oh, I'm really sorry, you're not using the stairs as they were defined. You're not really supposed to run up and down them. We need to educate you on how to use the stairs. You can sort of walk up them a bit fast, but really, you know, one and a half kilometers an hour is the most. You would probably get a slap in the face for doing that. And quite rightly so, because this person's using it for what's important for them. But now think about some of the language which we use in organizations. If people aren't using the systems or processes in the way we expect, we, often people say, we just need to educate them. Well, do we? Or do we need to understand their needs a bit better to ensure that we create or, and co-create solutions and systems that actually work for them and with them? And for me, this is another key takeaway for agility. It's about really understanding not just how we think people use and interact with our services, but actually observing and responding to the way that they do. So let me give you another quick example. So a few months ago, I went to my doctor with some very minor symptoms as a sort of standard thing that doctors do. Uh, he sent me for a routine blood test. And the way it works here in the UK is you go to a, a clinic to have the blood taken and then they send the results back to your doctor. So I go out to the receptionist and she's struggling to make the computer work. I, I don't know who, in doctor surgeries here in the UK, um, the, the, the IT seems to get in the way of the receptionists, almost always. 
And as I went, as I was leaving, she gave me a printout, which I was to give the blood taker, which told the specific samples and coloured of, of the vials to put them in to send them to the lab. Uh, and she also gave me this, which was the sort of human readable bit, which said, I need to ring St. Mary's Phlebotomy Clinic. Now, I'd never heard the word phlebotomy before. I had to look it up, but apparently it means blood <laughs> or blood taking. Uh, and so I rang St. Mary's Phlebotomy Clinic and they answered with what I thought was a much better name. They said St. Mary's Blood Clinic uh, and they booked me in at a very convenient time. They were open before work, which was great. St. Mary's Hospital is about a half hour walk from where I live or a half hour drive because the traffic's terrible. So I walked it. And I don't know if you've ever been into a hospital campus you're not familiar with, but they're really confusing places. So I was walking, trying to work out the signs. And you've got, well, you know, Portsmouth Dermatology Centre, Portsmouth Enablement Centre, this little Brymore sign there pointing to, it seems to be pointing towards some traffic cones. I have no idea what that means. You've got the day surgery, you've got day surgery and outpatients. I have no idea where I'm supposed to be going. So I just went in here. I went in the day surgery uh, and very friendly receptionist you know medical staff are great in our in our nhs here in the uk national health service but like without dropping a beat like it was the hundredth time she said it she'd said it that day even though it was only 8 a.m she said blood tests are over the car park in the main building follow the orange road i was like follow the orange road okay so i go over uh, find the building and she's right and actually blood tests you do literally follow a, 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 an orange road or an orange the walls are orange but I thought it's interesting isn't it like like she was having to say that hundreds of times a day but nobody had changed the signs there was obviously no feedback mechanism right you think back to that appreciation from that first diagram like nobody was was taking her feedback into account so, so again, agility is about hearing those voices and responding and might even involve changing signs. It might, might involve, in, in our world, a user interface if people aren't using it well or, or, or whatever. So anyway, I got to the, 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 the appointment and the, uh, the phlebotomist was asking me some questions to validate I am who I say I am. And then she said, and when, have you, when did you last eat? And I said, about an hour ago. And she said, oh, you were supposed to fast. And I said, oh really, I, nobody told me that. And she said, yeah, you know what? This happens a lot. And again, as a business analyst, it's like ringing in my head. Well, hang on a minute. There's like, why is, why is nobody addressing that? So again, building processes, systems that pick up on that feedback is really important. Anyway, she said I could, ha I could either have the test done, have the results sent back to my doctor, and let the doctor make the decision whether I need to re repeat the test or I could just go back and ask for a repeat test. So I just said, well, take the blood, I'm here. And you know, lo and behold, I did need to repeat the test. I fasted next time and everything was fine. So I wanna talk about a couple of techniques now to, to sort of illuminate that, that mini vignette of a case study even further. And the first technique I want to talk about is critical systems heuristics, CSH. Now that's a very convoluted name and there's a lot of, there's a lot of depth to this technique. I'm just going to scratch the surface, but if you Google it, there are some very good papers on it. And for us as BAs, what we can think of it as is a series of 12 question prompts. So you can see here we've got different columns like role specific concerns, roles and key problems. And then there are different rows as well and where they intersect. These are different question areas like purpose. Uh, you know, who's the client and beneficiary? How would we measure improvement? Who's the decision maker and, and so on and so forth. I won't go through each one in turn. As I say, there's, there's more reading out there or you can look at the slides after. But what I've, I've started to use these as prompts in my elicitation sessions. So let's just take one row. Let's take the, for argument's sake, the top row. And let's imagine we were talking about that blood taking, that phlebotomy service. 
Well, if you were to ask, say, me what the purpose of that service was, I'd say, well, it's to take my blood to diagnose whether I'm sick or not. If you ask me who the client or beneficiary is, I'd say me. And if you ask me how you could improve that service, I'd say, well, first of all, tell me I need to fast in advance. And you know, I want lots of flexibility over when I can have an appointment and I want to be able to cancel it and reorganize it and I want to get the results really quickly. Okay. And that's a valid perspective. If you ask the phlebotomist, well, they might have a narrower view for all I know. They might say, well, the purpose is actually uh, for this particular step of the process is about taking blood in a clinically safe way, uh, getting it uncontaminated to the lab you know, uh, and whatever. They would probably see me as a client, I'm sure, but they may well see the doctor who's getting the results of the test as a client. And if they were looking for improvement, they might be looking at different clinical measures. Now, neither of those perspectives is inherently right, but think back to the steps, right, which were being used in a different way. If we're going to build whatever we call them, services systems, which respond to the environment that have that agility, then we really need to know the perspectives of people who are involved. And I find these question prompts really, really useful. You can also ask them in two different modes. You can say, for example, what would you say the purpose is? And what do you think that the purpose ought to be? That can lead to some interesting conversations. So there's a lot more I could say about that technique. I will pause it there, but if you want to know more, do, as I say, there's lots of excellent reading online. This can, this can lead on to some really interesting conversations that can be documented with a systems map. A systems map is a, a snapshot of a system of interest from a particular perspective. And if you imagine, like, let's imagine we were interviewing the phlebotomist, we were perhaps using critical systems heuristics, and we just start to ask, well, what's important to you? What things, what systems, what entities are important to you in, within your system of interest? Well, they might say, well, you know what? You know, we, we perhaps established that they, that they consider it the, the purpose to be a system to take blood. And they say, well, you know, well, well you know, I'm part of the system. Uh, obviously, my blood taking equipment. There's a scheduling service and there's a record keeping system which has patient information and samples and so on. And you literally just draw them as blobs. And when something's like a, a component of something else, you draw it as a blob within a blob. Like that's what us, us like in systems thinking is known as a subsystem. Okay. And it doesn't have to represent reality. It's just what this person thinks is that it's what's important to them. And the reason it's important is you can then say, okay, and why does all of this exist? Why do we take blood? And you can zoom out. And that blood taking phlebotomy service we were looking at, well, maybe that exists in a broader system to test the blood of a patient. And that involves a lab, a general practitioner, a doctor who gets the results, another scheduling service. Interesting, isn't it? We've got scheduling at two levels. Maybe there's a conflict there. Maybe as BAs, that's something we need to look at. And we've maybe got a different record keeping system, which again might be a source of some issues. So we start to zoom out. And any, you know, if we were working at, at this previous level, if we were tinkering and making changes, well, if we're going to exhibit agility, we need to know what's happening at this level because we need to make sure that our solutions are coherent and actually integrate with it. But then we can zoom out even further and say, well, why are we testing the blood of a patient? You can keep going and going with this. Well, we're probably testing blood to diagnose a patient. Why are we diagnosing them? To treat their illness. Why are we treating the illness? Well, to keep people well. And the reason this is so important is it's so easy. We've all done it to be like tinkering, changing a small thing in, in, in a tiny subsystem. But if we don't do it in a way that is consistent and coherent with the broader purpose, with the broader, uh, bigger picture, then we just end up creating situations where, like in that example, you know, the receptionist gives the same advice 20 million times a day because nobody's realised that a change is necessary. Or we make things worse. In, you know, we, we displace a problem uh, elsewhere. So systems maps, I find really good conversation pieces. They're, they're never, I've, I've never really used them as formal artifacts, but for sense making, for saying where, where's the problem? 
they can be really uh, useful conversation pieces. So I want to move on now and talk about understanding the problem situation. And that crazy example I opened with, with the nuclear advice in the UK in the 1980s, is an example where the government hadn't, or areas of the government, hadn't taken into consideration the broader external environment. I'm pretty sure many, most or even all of us will be f familiar with external environment analysis techniques like PESL, PEST, STEEP, STEEPLE, whatever you want to call it. I use STEEPLE. I mean, calling it a technique is too grand. It's really just a set of, you know, it's an acronym, a mnemonic, stands for social, technological, economic, environmental, political, legal, ethical. And these are just headings. They're placeholders for conversations about the external social factors, technological factors, etc., that might affect our organization. Think back to that first diagram. These are the things in the flux. And if our organization hasn't got the appreciative setting, if it doesn't look for them, it can't respond to them. If we merge that with that idea of a systems map, what we're really saying is these are the things that happen outside of whatever boundary we've drawn. We can't change them, but we can respond to them. And But in order to respond to them, in order to have that agility, we need to know that they're there. So I know often pestle and steeple and techniques, they're perceived as a strategic tool, which they are, but sometimes that, that's, people assume that, that means you can only use it on like strategic in, initiatives. But I think we always need to know, like, you know, our projects, we need to be delivering projects that work within not just the context of the internal system map that we've drawn, but also it needs to work with the external steeple factors. So it's a, you know, it's a useful technique to revisit I believe regularly. But of course, most of the time, as well as the external factor, there'll be some internal problem that we're responding to. And I just want to very briefly talk about the multiple cause diagram. This is a technique I wish I'd found about a decade before I found it. And at its essence, it's really simple. I'll show you an abstract example, then I'll show you a worked one. So you take some form of event or state, a problem. That could be a negative event that's happened, like we've had a data breach, or it could be some kind of negative state change, like our profits are dropping or whatever. That's, you know, could be at a smaller level than that as well. And you track back all of the causes. You know, use five whys and why else. This is like a, like a fishbone diagram for complex even more complex situations where there's no order or little order to the categories and here what we're saying is well the proximate the primary causes of the event are a and b but you know what e causes a and b and g causes e and a and so on and we'd gather data or if we can't gather data we'd, we'd brainstorm to work out the causation and they might be theories of causation we might need to go and prove them but it gives us a, a start point now, what most organizations do when they are problem solving in inverted commas is they will sort of say, well, let's let's solve A and B. Right. right? And that will work. But unsurprisingly, the problem will come back because you haven't solved any of the sort of deeper root causes. So let me show you a worked example. Let's imagine we were trying to solve that problem of patients not fasting before they went to their blood test. This is just my perspective. This isn't, I haven't consulted any clinicians with this. Well, it's interesting and I, and I won't talk you through the diagram because you can look at the slides after and, and look at it in detail, but what you'll notice, and this happens on every, pretty much every multi-cause diagram I've ever really drawn, um, is you get causal hubs. And causal hubs are useful because they help redefine the problem. Because maybe we say, okay, well, we've expressed the problem as the patient hadn't fasted. But maybe a way of reframing that is to say, well, the doctor's practice hadn't told the patient. It's a different lens to look on the problem. You then get these causal chains. So here, for example, you can see there is a causal chain related to IT. 
Now that what like solving that won't solve the whole problem, but it might solve part of it. You can actually start to draw boundaries around it and say, this is the bit we're going to start with. You could build a backlog or, you know, some epics off the back of some of these things and do an experiment and, and try it and implement it. And if it works, do some more. If it, if it doesn't, then, then reverse it. Those sorts of things. This really starts to get into the even more actionable element of agility. So we can draw a boundary around the area we're going to play with um, and we can experiment. We can really start to figure out what we need to change. So that leads us very briefly to our final section, which is proposing and taking action. And in this section, the, the techniques I'm going to talk about are not specifically systems thinking techniques, but they complement them and they sort of bridge the systems thinking techniques I've talked about into the BA world. So the first technique I want to look at is the brown cow model. And this is from James and Suzanne's Robertson's book, Mastering the Requirements Process. If you've not come across that book, it is fantastic. I would highly, highly recommend getting a copy on it or of it I, 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 if you can. It's available on Kindle. It's a, it's a great reference. And it's called the brown cow model because in uh, in the in sort of speaking elocution lessons, there was a phrase which is how now brown cow. And what the brown cow model does is it separates the what from the how. So you can see we've got the what and the how, and it separates the now and the future. And you've got four quadrants. So in the bottom left hand corner, you have the how now view. And a lot of the analysis we do quite rightly is on the how now. How does this physically work? That's like physical processes, for example. But what we can do is scrape away the technology. Think about the essence of what's done and we can create a what now view. So if let's say there was a step in the process, which was, I don't know, someone signs an application with a pen that's a physical thing the what now might be authorizes application you can then have a conversation about the future what like work redesign this is where all the innovation happens or most of the innovation happens it's like well actually we don't want to have to authorize applications in the future you know we want something completely different then you can move down to talk about how that is implemented you put layer the technology on again now the 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 problem, I think, is most organisations or certainly most organisations I've ever worked with try and do this. They try and go from how now to future how. They say things like, we've got Oracle On Demand CRM and we want Salesforce.com CRM. OK, and it's like, well, OK, and you're probably just going to have you're going to be taking what you've got now and all of its problems and putting it into a new you know, and I'm nothing against Oracle or Salesforce. They're both great products, but you know, we ought to know why they're, why they're changing. So a far better way of, of going around this model is to appreciate the, that innovation cycle, go from the how now to the what now, scrape away the technology, do that above the line thinking where the innovation happens and then go back down again. I find this model incre incredibly useful for talking to stakeholders because once I find they, they realise that above the line thinking is where they're going to get the value. Uh, they really, really buy into it. I also want to talk very briefly about backcasting. If you imagine we're, we're in a current situation and if we do nothing, there's a predicted future. There's a trend like, you know, probably we're doing a project because we want to change something. Well, using all the techniques we've talked about, our Stacey matrix, our critical systems heuristics, our uh, systems maps, our multiple cause diagram, our, our how now, we've painted a future desired situation that we want to get to. But we haven't really specified how. So what we can do is chunk it down and say, well, what are the steps? What would they look like to get there? And rather than committing to the whole journey, you know, and this is going to this is going to come as no surprise because I'm pretty sure we're all or many of us will be working in an agile way or semi agile or at least incremental and iterative. Well, we can focus on that that first step. 
and carry out experiments along the way. And it might well be, by the way, particularly if we're in the complex area of that Stacey matrix, that, well, you know what, we get so far and we realise we made a mistake with the aim, you know, with our endpoint. Well, great, redefine it. You know, as long as the sponsor and whoever's happy with that, that's, that's fine. So if you think about traditional agile approaches, this is, these, this is where this starts to, to join up. We've gone from broad agility, now we're down in an executable agile uh, and analysis uh, territory. So in summary, we've talked about assessing context with the Stacey matrix, remembering that that's a, one of a number of tools that we can use to assess the complexity. If we were down in the bottom left hand corner, then I'd be saying probably uh, systems thinking isn't necessarily going to add a huge amount. But if we're in the middle of the complexity, then it really, really will. Or if we're in political decision making, then it, it, it will as well. We've talked about understanding perspectives and boundaries. Remember that people might use our system services and processes in ways that we don't really anticipate. And agility is about understanding that and building our, you know, our products in ways that works for people and appreciating when people are using them differently uh, that we might need to adapt. We looked at critical systems heuristics uh, and we looked at the system map as a way of exploring that. We then looked at understanding our problem situation with, uh, with the multiple cause diagram as a way of, of zooming out. Oh, we also looked at steeple, of course, looking outside the boundary of our systems map. We, we then talked about proposing and taking action, making all of this even more concrete and actionable by taking the ideas around the brown cow model and then um, backcasting and figuring out the next steps. And that's where you can definitely end up with a backlog with some epics with with some potential change but I just want to finish where I began because I open with this crazy story about possible nuclear war in the 1980s and the UK government's response to it and you remember the UK government's response was arguably not suitable in terms of civil defense and it was almost like best practice had been taken from a very different domain and applied to a situation where it didn't work. That was a lack of agility. It was a lack of understanding the external and internal factors. Now that might have seemed like a crazy example, but my question to you is a ponder point, a final ponder point, is how many times have you seen that pattern in your organization, in my organization, in all of our organizations, but more importantly, how as a global, enthusiastic, empowered community of practitioners can we help avoid those situations so that we create better business outcomes for our organisations and better societal outcomes for the communities in which we serve. And with that, I will say thank you very much and I will hand back to Paul. <laughs>